All right. So today, what we are going to do is we are going to discuss ketone bodies. All right. Ketone bodies. This is the discussion for the day. What do you think ketone bodies are? What do you think ketone bodies are? Anyone? Where do you think they come from? Yes. Ketone uh, bodies, these are substrates that are formed after beta oxidation of fatty acids. Okay, so they are formed after beta oxidation of fatty acids. And you see, when we had a discussion on beta oxidation last time we met, we were able to show that when you break down a fatty acid, you're going to be producing acetal OA. Alright? So you're going to produce a large number of acetal OAs. We were able to even show that from a fatty acid with 16 carbons, all you have to do is divide the number of carbons by 2, subtract 1. Well, when you just divide the number of carbons by 2, you know how many acetal coas you produce from that fatty acid. So if it's 16, 16 divided by 2, you have 8 acetal coa. If it's 18, 18 divided by 2, you have 9 acetal coas. And you well know that following beta oxidation, which is happening in the mitochondria, a lot of acetal OA is going to be produced. So now, let me just, before I detail the ketone bodies, let me probably just show you what the effect of beta oxidation is going to be, and then the acetal OA that is produced as well, so that we can have an understanding why ketone bodies would then have to be formed. All right? So, we said that you have your fatty acids, which when they are broken down in a series of reactions, are being converted into acetal CoA. This is happening in the mitochondria. Remember we made it clear that the rate limiting reaction of beta oxidation is simply entry of fatty acids into the mitochondria. There, they are going to be broken down in a series of steps to produce acetal CoA. So you have a large amount of acetal CoA being produced. Now, what's the effect of a high amount of acetal CoA? Right? And also, from beta oxidation, you well know that based on the number of cycles that this fatty acid is undergoing, it would produce an equivalent number of NADH and FADH2, right? So you have a high amount of NADH and a high amount of FADH2. After all, this is happening in a circumstance of starvation when you do not have enough carbohydrate taken in, right? What's the consequence of high acetal coa one of the things that you're going to see when there's a buildup of acetal CoA is this. Remember that acetal CoA can be produced from another source, which is pyruvate. And we said that acetal CoA is an allosteric inhibitor of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Remember? So it means that the reaction which is converting pyruvate into acetal CoA would be allosterically inhibited by acetal CoA itself. So there will be no acetal CoA being produced from the pyruvate. Right? The next thing is this acetal CoA is an allosteric activator of the enzyme which converts, which converts pyruvate into oxaloacetate, right? So this enzyme is going to be highly activated, the, the pyruvate carboxylase, which adds a carbon dioxide to pyruvate to produce oxaloacetate, is going to be highly activated due to the 
high amounts of acetone A. What's the consequence of this? It is that the pyruvex channels into production of oxaloacetate. Now, this is happening in a circumstance where somebody has starved for a very long time. So it's happening in gluconeogenic conditions. So what will happen then is that due to the high amounts of NADH that are available and a reduced amount of NAD+, plus, this oxaloacetate would actually be quickly reduced. D plus to mallet. So there won't be enough oxaloacetate to combine with your acetyl CoA and go down the TCA cycle. Right? So this oxaloacetate is quickly converted to mallet, which is a reaction you and I are aware is part of the gluconeogenic pathway. Mallet goes out of the mitochondria, converted back to oxaloacetate, then converted into phosphoenyl pyruvate and goes up to produce glucose. You see that? So, this just implies that you will have a buildup of acetyl CoA, which cannot combine to, to actually go down. The TCA cycle effectively due to a reduction in oxaloacetate. Also, you know, after CoA cannot leave the mitochondria. After all, this is happening in the mitochondria, particularly of the liver cells, where you have a high amount of beta oxidation occurring as well. So then, where will the acetyl CoA go? And we're asking this question, knowing that during beta oxidation, for you to produce acetyl CoA from a fatty acyl CoA, the last reaction actually requires a CoA. Remember theolytic cleavage? The CoA comes in to produce an acetyl CoA and a fatty acyl CoA. So if beta oxidation continues, there will be depletion of CoA. And if CoA is depleted, beta oxidation will stop because this is a necessary requirement for beta oxidation to occur. So one of the reasons why after CoA has to be converted into ketone bodies is for it to release the CoA, which is attached to it, so that beta oxidation continues in a circumstance where somebody is stuck. You and I know that this NADH and FADH2 are going to go down the electron transport chain and be used as a source of energy. Is that okay? So, to release the CoA to allow beta oxidation to continue and energy production to continue, in a circumstance where somebody has stuck, you will need to go in the direction where ketone bodies are going to be formed. So this is why ketone bodies are going to be formed. Ketone bodies are going to be synthesized in the hepatocytes. This will be the site of synthesis of ketone bodies. Once they have been synthesized, they will be carried in the blood for they will then be able to leave the mitochondria, go in the blood and be used by peripheral tissue as a source of energy. So how then are ketone bodies going to be formed? So allow me to remove these other things here so that we just dwell on acetyl CoA because it's the primary precursor for ketone body synthesis. So this goes out.
Okay. And I will still show that from fatty acid oxidation. Now, we said that you have a high amount of acetal OA following beta oxidation. What would happen then is that you will have two molecules of acetal OA combined as they go down to produce ketone bodies. So probably let's just go ahead and show this structure wise. So you have one acetal OA there. Acetal OA and another acetal OA so this with the help of thiolase you discover that the reaction is going to lead to a loss of a CoA and this makes one CoA available for beta oxidation to occur in the next reaction and there when the OA comes in it will lead to production of acetal OA and also it will lead to production of NADH and FATH2 is that okay? so one CoA is released and these two are actually going to combine and you have Okay. I'm going to show the S here, so we know what it does. This here is acetoacetal acetoacetal CoA. Guys, this is acetoacetal CoA. And if you look at it nicely, you know that this is the last products when it comes to beta oxidation like the final beta oxidation when you're breaking down palmitic acid there will be a fatty acyl CoA with which with four carbons and when it undergoes beta oxidation it will reach this part so that when you put a CoA here it will produce two acetal CoAs this is aceto acetal CoA Guys, this is not a ketone body. Alright? And I'm emphasizing this because I tend to like asking a question and putting acetoacetal CoA as one of the examples of ketone body. So this is a warning. It's not a ketone body. I'll let you know when we meet one. Alright? So the next reaction. Another CoA, another acetal CoA particularly, is going to come in. Three. This acetal CoA is going to come in. 